the song we were just singing, asking God to revive us again. For some of you who are here, you don't need revival, you need awakening. And I don't mean that you're tired and you need to wake up, although maybe that's some of you. But for some, awakening needs to happen. And what that is, is that the, the Spirit of God would work in your heart and you would see the beauty and glory of Christ and the glory of the Gospel and you would cry out to Him for the first time for salvation. That's awakening. Revival is for those that have already been revived. Born again. They are believers, followers of Jesus, but they found themselves in a season where the Word just isn't as sweet. You find yourself in a season where the, the Gospel and the promises of God, they're just not very real to you right now. The truths of Scripture, the, the promises, you're finding it hard to believe. You're finding it hard to fight sin. So we're singing and asking God, the Spirit, to revive us again. As we look around, we see that we are missing quite a few. Either they got wind of what this sermon was going to be, and they're like, we ain't going. <laughs> or we're going to trust in the good providence of our God that if you are here this morning, it is because God wants to speak to you from this passage through this donkey today. My hope is that God will make some sense out of the mess going on in my brain with this text today. Because up until about 10 o'clock last night, I had one direction I was going with this text. But apparently that was the direction I was going to go with the text. And then the Spirit has decided that we're going to hone in somewhere different still in this text which is glorious when you think about Scripture and how there's so many facets to Scripture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and ask for God's help to make this clear coming out of my mouth and will help all of you to understand and apply this text to your lives. Let's pray together before we jump into the text. Father, we do thank You that we can gather in this place. And God, we know that no matter how hard we try, we cannot make ourselves look more like Jesus. We know no, no matter how hard we try, we cannot save ourselves. So God, I pray for those who are here who, who are in need of salvation, that they would cry out to You. For those who are here who are followers of Jesus and they want to look more like Jesus, I pray they'd cry out to You. But Lord, help us see in this text what so often sabotages this. What gets in our lives and in our hearts and does the opposite of what we're desiring, God. Holy Spirit, help me to communicate this clearly to your people. Holy Spirit, help those out here who are under the sound of my voice that they would hear this in their minds. And, and Holy Spirit, you take it and move it, move it deep into their soul, into their hearts. And that you would help us to apply it and be changed. God, would you do this now in Jesus' name? Amen. I'm going to talk briefly Romans chapter 7 where we were a few weeks ago. We found great relief, or at least help, from the fact that the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that his, his body, his mind, his heart, his heart in particular, is constantly at battle against his flesh. And he says that there's things that he wants to do that he doesn't do, there's things that he knows he, he shouldn't do that he does, and, and it's just this whole battle, and we found this very helpful in the sense of that we're not alone in that. That the Apostle Paul struggles this way, and so do all Christians. But the fact that the Spirit has come inside of us, that He has changed us to where we actually do delight in the law of God in our inner being. 
And chapter 7 ended with the Apostle Paul saying, and we should be saying with him, O wretched man or woman that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. We then moved into chapter 8. And it starts off in such a a beautiful way because it just says that who's going to deliver me? Well, Jesus is going to deliver me, but that still means there's a lot of sin in my life. Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we've talked about that the last few weeks. We're so thankful that there's no condemnation for those who, again, key word, in Christ. We said that chapter 8 is going to end with because you are in Christ, there's no separation from the love of Christ ever for those who are in Him. Continuing on in chapter 8, we covered really the Apostle Paul showing us what it means for those who are in Christ, that their their mind is going to be on the law of the Spirit instead of the law of the flesh. Why? Because he sent his Son to condemn it. To destroy it. And we're defined differently now. We are people of the Spirit. Even though at times we still struggle with the flesh that remains in us. We're not in the flesh, we're in the Spirit. However, there is still some of the flesh inside of us. And we took great hope in the fact of verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's definitely at the end when we're resurrected. He's going to give life to us. We're going to live forever with God, with Jesus. But also in this life now, we can have spiritual life. So let me read from 12 through 17 in the bulletin. It was much further, but like I said, the the Lord has changed that some. So we're going to focus on 12 through 17. Let me read while you follow along silently, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. So then, brothers or brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God or sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. The Apostle Paul starts in verse 12 here. Based upon what he just had said, obviously, in the previous verses, is all continuing thought, but we cannot meet for 25 hours in a day and go through verse by verse, so we have to break it up. So he starts here in verse 12, going off of what he had just said, which we covered last week. So then, brothers and sisters, since Jesus is going to give life to your dead bodies in the life to come and even now, so then you are not a debtor to the flesh. You don't owe the flesh anything. You don't have to listen to the flesh. You don't have to follow the flesh. You're you're not a debtor to the flesh to live according to the flesh. You're free from sin. The power of sin. Presence, still around. Do we still have our flesh around? Yes. But it's not how you're defined any longer. We've heard this throughout Romans. And then it's this next verse where God changed the direction of the sermon. So then, brothers and sisters, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. 
Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will, what does the text say? Die. Die. Live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will, what does it say? Live. Life and death. Two things going on here, and look what it says. Live according to the flesh, you get death. Live according to the Spirit, or if you put to death the things, the deeds of the body, you will live. And at first, I was just moving past this. And then God grabbed a hold of me. And last night, I spent a few hours reading at least a third of a book by John Owen called The Mortification of Sin. You may not have heard that, and you might go, that's a mouthful. It is. It's from the 1600s. But the, the killing of sin. Killing of sin. And I'm thinking about this. What does this mean? And what does verse 13 mean? Okay, let's, let's break it down. This first part is clear. If you're going to live according to the flesh, you're going to die, Okay? So, for, for those who, whose minds are not on the Spirit, you're going to die eternally, forever. Eternal death. But also, brothers and sisters, there is a side here, I believe, a warning, if you will, that if you do not do what he says to do here in verse 13, spiritually speaking, you're not going to die in the sense of losing your salvation but you're going to feel spiritually dead. You ever felt that? Ever, ever felt where there's just no connection between you and God? You're reading the Word and there's just nothing coming. You're lacking love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like it's not even there. God, am I even saved? I don't even know if I'm saved. I believe that part of what Paul's helping us with here is explaining what's going on there. So setting or living according to the flesh, you'll die eternally if you don't have Christ. And as a believer, if you're constantly living according to that, that flesh that's still inside of you, spiritually there's going to be just nothing there. Not that the Spirit leaves, but I mean as far as what you experience with God. So none of us here want to live according to the flesh, right? Amen? Nobody wants that. Okay? What's my other option? Look at this. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We have to figure out what that means. Right? You will live if you do these things, so we need to figure out what that means. So I broke it down on your notes here, and again, they're all over the place because it was late. But let me start with the first part. So look in the text, look in 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, let's look at the first part, by the Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. No one else and nothing else can kill sin in your life. No shot. If you try to kill sin any other way, it's not going to happen. There are some things that can be done, and some of you rely on this, that can change the behavior or the thinking some. What I mean is there may be some steps in a program you can do to get your outward behavior to change. Different things in psychology to make you look at things differently, perhaps. It does not get the root. It will not take away your sin. You might stop doing something outwardly, but we know that the outward working is just what's wrong on the inside. So someone just jumps on, oh, I have this outward work. Well, I could change this. Well, now I'm okay. I did, I did a 12-step program, and I stopped drinking. So guess what? I'm okay now. No, you're not. The root issues are still there. In fact, now there's something even worse. Now you think you did it on your own. 
See, what happens is when we try to do these through different psychology or looking closer to yourself or this different steps program or whatever it is, here's what happens. One of two things happen. You're constantly discouraged because you never have true victory. And even though things change outwardly, you know deep inside it has not changed inwardly. Or you have some sort of victory and you get, you get fooled to thinking that you've had victory. And then pride comes. This has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who renews your mind. The Spirit is the one who gives you a new heart. The Spirit is the one who lives inside of you. He's the one that burns away the root of the sin. He's the one that convicts you of sin. He's the one that gives you power to overcome sin. Only the Spirit can do this, as Owen says in his book. Sin must be bitter to swallow, or it will go down to your heart and harden your heart. Only the Spirit can do that. You cannot make sin taste bad to you because if you are in the flesh, guess what? It's going to taste good to you. Only the Spirit can do that. That's the first part of that by the Spirit. The second part, go back to our verse there, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, you... You have a role in this. Obviously, it's by the Spirit we just said that. But it's not like you can just sit back and do nothing. You have to fight. You have to use the means that the Spirit gives to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Some of you are not fighting. You're just okay with it. You're just okay with my sin. You're just okay with things in my heart. It's all right. Well, God will take care of it. He's given a means for that to happen. So, by the Spirit, you, back in verse 13, put to death the deeds of the body. Put to death. Wow, listen, think, think, think about that. Put Picture, putting something to death. Killing something. Paul is saying, you, by the Spirit, need to put to death the deeds of the body. What are the deeds of the body? Sin. Go over to Galatians and you can see what the outworking of the flesh is. You've, you've, got, to, you've, you've got to put that to death by the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body. How do you fight? I'm supposed to kill something or someone. What am I going to use? I need to use something to do that. God, you want me to kill my, my, the deeds of my flesh? You're telling me to do this. You give me the means to do it. You give me the Spirit. I'm supposed to do it by the Spirit. What does the Spirit use? You need a weapon. You need a sword. You need a sword. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of grace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation. And some of you are really good at this. You're really good at having all these things on and you're ready to go. The problem is there's a war happening and you're supposed to fight. And instead you're just constantly getting clocked. Boom, boom, boom. Guess what? Just in case, in case you didn't know this, sin does not take a day off. Satan doesn't take a day off. Your flesh doesn't take a day off. The world is constantly after you. If you don't believe that, read your Bibles. They're constantly coming. And some of you, oh, salvation, all these things are great. But you don't pull out the sword. Verse 17 again, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? The Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Your weapon is the sword. It's the Word. Look what it says in Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the Word of God, living, active, sharper than any two. It's sharper than any other sword. Piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and of marrow, discerning. Look at the, look what the word does. The thoughts and the intentions of the heart. 
And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. The Spirit uses the Word in this battle. That's how you kill your flesh. The deeds of the flesh. How you kill sin. The Spirit, here's the Word, use it to do it. So I have some things on here. You must read the Word and pray the Word. We have a lot of great books over there. If you're reading those books instead of your Bible, put them down or bring them back. If you're watching stuff on television, even if it's some, oh, this is really interesting. It's telling me about the Middle East or it's telling me about Jerusalem and what happened to Read your Bible. Get in the Word of God. It is your only weapon. And a book is really only as good as as much of the Word of God it has in it. It's your weapon. You're constantly being hit. It's like if we could see what's going on spiritually, if we could watch one another and see one another, what we would see is just a constant battle from the world just getting hit from all sides, and you feel that sometimes. And we're trying to have our shield and our helmet. We're just getting hit back and forth. And we're seeing this in each other's lives, and you're not pulling out the sword. You've got to put it to death. That's what the Spirit uses. So we must read the Word and pray the Word. Let the Spirit use the Word to search your heart and mind. You are so easily deceived, and so am I. We've got brothers and sisters right now who think I need to be away from the body so that way I can fix myself before I come back to the body. It's never how it goes, folks. It's deceived. You think, oh, i got, I got to get right before I get with my brothers and sisters. No! This is the place you come. These are the people. What are we going to do with one another? What do we do? We sing the Word to one another. We preach the Word. We share the Word. We read the Word. We pray the Word. Why? It's our weapon. We're so deceived. We think we can justify our sin. We can justify all these things in our minds. It's okay. Guess what the Word of God does? The Word of God comes and it bears on your soul and it says, no, you cannot. You've got to let the Word work in your life. And guess what? Reading for two minutes as you walk out the door and say, good quiet time today, praise God. That does not count. That is not the same thing. I'm not saying things don't pop up or it's not challenging, but it's priorities. And it's not just doing it to check a box. It's doing it because your Savior wants to talk to you. The Spirit wants to move you. So you say, search my heart and my mind and show me. If, if it's been a long time since you're like, yeah, I, I'm, I, I've, I need to repent of that sin and ask for forgiveness from somebody. If that's been a while for you, that's probably a problem. Because we have so much sin all around us and we still have our flesh inside of us. We're so easily deceived. Listen to the word being sung and preached to the depths of your soul. Don't, as soon as the song starts, go, well, that's not my style. They're using a piano. Well, I don't like it when they use the guitar. No. What are the words saying? Sing deep into my soul. And here's the thing. When you hear the word preached, when you're reading the word, when we're doing Bible studies, don't do this. Don't go, oh, that's a good point. Jenny McCain needs to hear that. Mm-hmm. Oh, the whole time he was preaching, I was thinking of Brent. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is for your soul first. Be thinking, asking God, how is this to bear on me? Last here, and there's others you could add here, but the last thing I have, just kind of some practical, memorize the Word and apply it to the sinful thoughts and actions in your lives. Apply it. Say, you know what? I really struggle with gossip. How many of you think you might struggle with gossip? Okay. There's a bunch of verses in the Bible to fight that. How many of you memorized? How many of you? So other people who raise their hand say, you know what? You and I need to text one another and, and text the Word of God and say, hey, how are you doing with gossip today? Here's a Bible verse to fight it. That's the fight. The sin comes. We're to put that sin to death. How? With the Word. So you have to memorize it or read it. Put a, a sticky note on your car mirror. Put it in your bathroom. Put it on your forehead for all I care. Put it somewhere and use it to fight. Use it to fight. Why? Well, it honors God and glorifies Him, but go back into our text. 
If you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Live. True life. Life eternal, but life right now. And John's gospel talks about eternal life, and what that is is actually knowing God and knowing His Son. So what this means, Christian, is to experience the, the full fruit of the Spirit, to experience a spiritual life now, to, to its fullest that you can, you have to be putting sin to death. So this is what happens. Listen carefully. This is what happens. This battle's going on, and we, we do our spiritual disciplines. We, we do read our Bible, and we, we pray, and we come to the worship service, and we meet with other people, and you serve in various ways. And you go, it's not working. You ever had that? You're doing everything. Everything that we can give you opportunity. Every time these doors are open, you're here, and you're trying to, and you're like, it's not working. What I think could be going on and why this passage is here is there may be sin in your life and in your heart that you have not killed. See what I'm saying? So picture like this, and Owen does this in his book and it's helpful. Picture a garden, beautiful garden. Some of you love to garden. Picture you have some, I don't know, vegetables, fruit, and it's planted there. And then, then picture there's a bunch of weeds and thorns and thistles around the plant. Does the plant still exist? Is it still there? Yeah, the plant's there. Is it as healthy as it could be? No. You might be able to go in and pull back those weeds and go, oh, there it is. I found the plant. But it's being choked out. Your heart's the garden. Your heart's the garden. The Spirit is in your heart if you're a follower of Jesus. And it's not taken away. But what are the thorns and the thistles and the weeds that are there? The sin in our lives. And if you don't kill them, quick question for those of you who garden, please help. If I continually have some, some weeds in my garden, and I go in with my weed eater, and I go over the top of them real quick, and I go away, what happens in a few days, a few weeks, what happens? They come back up, don't they? Why, why do they come back up? You didn't get the roots. I didn't get the roots. <laughs> I didn't get them. All I did was try something to take it off the top. What the Spirit does is He uses the Word to kill the root. And many of us are doing a lot of good things, but we are not killing sin by asking the Spirit to use the Word to show it, bear it in my life, show in my heart what is going on, and repent of it and change. And so you say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't have a lot of joy or a lot of peace or all these different things. It may be for you that you're not killing sin. Owen says this, you either be killing sin or it'll be killing you. It's not like it takes a day off. It's constantly coming after you. But don't get discouraged. Let's finish. For all, verse 14, who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Here's what's beautiful, you guys. Is if you're a follower of Jesus, this will be happening in your lives. Now, it could be happening more if we would put it to death more often, but if you can say, as a follower of Jesus, I have the Spirit of God inside of me, and there are times that by the Spirit I put sin to death. That's the same thing as verse 14 as being led by the Spirit. Okay? It's the same thing. So, being led by the Spirit. This is why this is actually a passage of assurance. Here's the encouragement for you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. So many times people come and they're doubting. I think this is actually reassuring. It goes into verse 15. For 
You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You didn't get this new spirit. You didn't get a spirit of slavery. Here's what you got. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The encouragement here is, oh man, what do I need? I mean, I need to put to death the sin in my life by the Spirit. I need to do that. But man, sometimes I don't do that. Back to Romans 7, and I'm really worried about it. You don't need to be fearful, Christian. You're a son or daughter of God. Not everybody's a son and daughter. Realize that? You can't say that only those who are in Christ are sons and daughters and say everybody's a son and daughter. You have to be in Christ. Why? Because adoption takes place. Through Christ, we're adopted. And so what verse 16 says, the Spirit Himself, as you're adopted into God's family through trusting in the, the death of Jesus on the cross, in your place for your sins, and His resurrection, Trusting that you're, you get adopted into God's family. God now is father instead of enemy. And you receive the Spirit. And the Spirit Himself bears witness with your spirit that you truly are a child of God. And now watch this. This is where we're going to end. This should, this should blow your mind. Verse 17. And if you're a child, then you're an heir. Right? You get adopted into a family. There's no strings attached. You're adopted into the family because of Jesus. You're, into, you're part of the family. You get the same things Jesus gets. Are you kidding me? I'm a rebel against God, sinning against God, only focus on myself. Then you save me and adopt me. Give me your spirit to live inside of me. You adopt me. And now I'm an heir. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Let me read this quickly to you. Ephesians chapter 3. Or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1. Starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Maybe you missed that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not some of the spiritual blessings. Every spiritual blessing is yours in Christ. Why? Because you're adopted in the family and you're a co-heir with Christ. And our passage today ends with this. You're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Look, little, little something tacked on the end there. Provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. That shouldn't get you right away to go back to fear and doubt. I actually would say that this does the opposite. I think that this is again assurance and encouragement. Why? Because you're an heir with Christ if you suffer. How many of you suffer? How many of you suffer for the Gospel? I hope that you're suffering in some way for the gospel. Here's the encouragement. When bad things happen, you don't say, I wonder if God loves me. When suffering comes for the gospel, you don't say, I wonder if He loves us. You don't have to say that. It's not that God doesn't love you, it's that you belong to Him. So you suffer with Christ and thus will be glorified with Christ. You're adopted into the family. So let me read to you the last part here out of Revelation 2.17, the church of Pergamum. You're adopted into the family. So here's what the Apostle John would write. To the one who conquers... I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone, white and pure, with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. You're adopted in the family and you get a new name and the Spirit seals you and that name, you're the only one who knows what it is, you and God. 
Think about the intimacy there. We continue to remember, friends, there's no condemnation, there's no separation, and we praise God for his grace. Amen?